All right, I'm going to get started, even though we're um, we're slowly building the So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Welcome. Uh, Elizabeth Ashbourne, I'm PQMD's Executive Director. I want to welcome you on behalf of our entire team to this special primary involving ESG landscape. This event serves as an overture the 2024 Global Health Policy Forum, which will be kicking off in exactly two weeks in New York City. Our forum, just for those of you who aren't familiar, um, brings together more than 100 global health leaders together uh, to lead in-depth discussions and build cross-sectoral knowledge to meet the global public health challenges of today and the opportunity of tomorrow. Our theme this year is Global Health Leadership in Turbulent Times, and we have a spectacular set of uh, speakers who will be joining us. We also have a session where we will be continuing a dialogue around the concepts and thinking of ESG, and a link to the forum agenda will be dropped into the chat for those of you who have registered, so there's still time to make that happen. So very quickly, uh, just a little keeping, Try, please type your name in the chat box and let us know your organization. And while we request that everybody stay on mute, we do really encourage you to ask questions and comments in the, and put comments into the chat. And this session is recorded and will be posted on PQMD's community of practice uh, in a few days. So definitely this. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Veronica Ariave, who will be our moderator today. Veronica is the Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Global Philanthropy for Baxter Healthcare and the Executive Director of the Baxter International Foundation. Veronica is the perfect person to guide us through this conversation today. So thank you all for joining us. And now, Veronica, over to you. Thank you, EJ, for the warm welcome. A big thanks for all of you for joining us today. I see people. Folks are coming in fast and furious, so we're really excited to get started. Um, what I want to start with is just to say, since 2016, PQMD has successfully hosted the Global Health Policy Forum, and the events have gone around the world. They've been on relevant topics that matter to corporate and NGO sector stakeholders, and this year is no exception. ESG and corporate responsibility or corporate citizenship or sustainability, whatever you call it, um, and while the term is under you know, contention by some, the tenets and principles of ESG are here to stay. Fundamentally, I think stakeholders are really placing a stake in the ground on climate action. And the goal here is to up-level the disclosures and reporting landscape for corporations, investors, governments, which ultimately I think will improve cross-sectoral value creation. So the topic aligns brilliantly with PQMD's Global Policy Forum topic because the world is at a time of unprecedented change. We are in turbulent times and our, I think our collective social impact, our sustainability and our philanthropic work is impacted in new ways. Um, and I think it's time for us to continue to consider how we innovate and adapt to the changes ahead of us. So today I'm hoping that we all have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about ESG or corporate responsibility as a part of that changing landscape. And our, for our corporate members, hopefully that they can join us on the 30th of April for our New York City uh, workshop at Pfizer's headquarter. So I'm joined today, I'm so excited, we have such a great group, by um, a number of highly respected colleagues in vital companies and organizations. I hope each of you have had a chance to review the bios for um, of our distinguished speakers, and I truly think we have leading voices from diverse stakeholders on the topic of ESG. So with that said, um, I want to make sure that each of our distinguished speak, uh, speakers will have an opportunity to share their perspective on what ESG means to them, to, to the sector in which they represent, and the implications that it has on our vital work. So time permitting, we'll have time at the end for questions uh, and comments. I, and as a moderator, I will go ahead and kick us off, and I will really provide us some context for our conversation and a little bit on a corporate perspective. So I'll sort of start with ESG in terms of how it's defined. Um, and I just kind of want to give you a really quick, and this is a broad stroke, so please um, consider it that, and really sort of looking at the E, the S, and the G, and sort of the environmental, social, and governance topics, you know, E really speaks to the company's impact on the natural world. So it covers a wide range of activities like sustainability concerns, like greenhouse gas emissions, air emissions, energy, utility usage, waste management, water, environmental reporting. And when we look at the S, we're really looking at focuses on how an organization treats people and operates as a member of its community 
and supply chain. So we think about health, safety, social, and sustainability. Think about employee engagement, uh, DEI, privacy, data protection, cybersecurity, uh, product safety, stewardship, uh, and, and labor uh, standards and human rights. And then as we look at the G, we're really talking about, you know, covers how well a company manages uh, and how well it abides by its ethical practices at all levels. And that means business ethics, risk mitigation, risk governance, regulatory, tax transparency, shareholder rights, and sort of board competition. So I think those are sort of the basic broad stroke of ESG as a definition and as a term. But I also want to kind of cover a little bit on the controversy, right? You know, with that in mind, there are a few, I think, controversies at play. The first is the term itself um, and whether or not it, it really represents the work that we all do as companies and or um, stakeholders in the space. I think the second is you G is an investment strategy, for example, in state and pension funds. And then the third is really looking at, you know, several components. The, the state and pension fund options really have several components and opponents. And then the third is whether corporations are linking people, the planet, uh, and profits to run its business responsibly. Without getting into the politics of that, I think that kind of gives you a basic sense of where, you know, how ESG is defined and what the controversies are at play. Um, I think overall companies are really expected to develop strategic systematic approach to ESG and integrate ESG risk management into their financial business model. So, um, and it's and it's really being noted as, you know, ESG performance is now being correlated to how um, a company's share price performs and, and its ability to raise capital. So it has, rel it has you know, it's significant relevance to the work that we do as companies, and then obviously where that, that trickle-down effect may be. So, um, you know, all, putting all the controversy, the politics aside, I would say the tenets and principles of ESG are solid. Um, ultimately, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats and companies want to do more and better to support smart, smart climate action. And I think our reporting landscape is changing to evolve to help us do that. So I'll go into sort of from a corporate perspective, and I'll say that ESG has quickly evolved from sort of an optional public reporting initiative to an increasingly uh, mandatory investor-driven requirement. So, uh, which is why we at Baxter um, and, and why DLA is here today is we've developed a workshop with DLA Piper again on the 30th of April to help us navigate the new corporate reporting landscape. From a Baxter perspective, Baxter's 2030 corporate responsibility um, commitment and goals are really building a longstanding commitment to ESG, and the company has been reporting its performance and progress for more than 30 years. So ultimately, we engaged DLA Piper at, given their expertise to help us mature our reporting capacity. Baxter has taken the next step by adopting a fully integrated approach to doing business responsibly and sustainably, and DLA is helping us get there. So with that, I um, kind of wanted to give you that sense of, of a corporate perspective. Uh, and then I'm really looking forward to hearing from Paula, um, our first speaker. Um, she's a director of ESG Research and Engagement at DSC Meridian Capital. To share from an investor lens, who better? I mean, honestly, who better to help us bridge uh, than Paula, who has led corporate responsibility for Pfizer um, for several years back and Hess Oil. And now, you know, in her new investor role capacity can give us a better sense um, of how the, the investor landscape is, is helping us understand ESG. So Paula, you know, I see your role as helping us sort of demystify the investor lens. First, I think the audience would appreciate sort of a better understanding of what investors are really looking for and how it's important stake, how this important stakeholder is unpacking the new regulatory environment. Maybe you sure. can just sort of give us a heads up there. Sure. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for having me. Um, I don't know if it was in my bio, but I was one of the midwives for PQMD. <laughs> um, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I feel your pain, uh, you know, I, whether it was my time at CARE or Pfizer, uh, these issues came up even back then meeting with investors. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to help demystify. I think, first of all, investors are not a monolith, right? There are different uh, players, just like in a company or an NGO, who have different roles who are going to be approaching you for different things. For example, um, you know, someone who's in charge of invest, investment stewardship at a place like BlackRock or State Street or an asset manager is probably more focused on proxy voting, right? So looking at um, governance issues, how your executives are paid and what they're paid to do, and any shareholder proposals 
um, you know, that speak to these ESG issues, whether it's climate action or, um, you know, DEI or what have you. And we've seen, you know, lots of, of growth in shareholder proposals. Those are people who have a different responsibility than the people inside an asset manager or a pension fund making direct investment decisions. Those people are actually looking for data to inform models that will tell them uh, something about where your security prices and your cost of capital are headed, right? They want to understand what has not been priced in uh, or what might be mispriced into your security prices and your cost of capital through exploration of uh, sort of material ESG issues. Um, so I think there's no one answer to this, but I hope that sort of helps unpack it, pack it a little bit. What's changed, uh, as Veronica uh, alluded to earlier, is that this is no longer a voluntary exercise in many jurisdictions. Uh, particularly climate disclosure is becoming mandatory. Um, uh, the, uh, and so this is, you know, this is really about regulatory compliance, which means that in your companies, a whole new cast of internal stakeholders are going to be affected and focused on this issue in a way they hadn't been in the past. So, Pella, how do you factor sustainability into investment decisions? Like on your day to day, um, how, do, how does this how does this play in? Sure, and and you know, bear in mind, uh, we are an active manager. We have a concentrated portfolio. That means we talk to management teams all the time. That's an important source of relationship development and information. We also don't have a, a thousand names in the portfolio. So you can really do deep, fundamental, bottom-up approach to each company and research on them. We start like many investors with the SASB framework. I know a number of the corporate colleagues on this call probably do a SASB or GRI or TCFD or all of the above aligned report. Um, and we believe SASB is a good jumping off point because it focuses on issues that are financially material to us, right, investors. So while philanthropy is an important part of what you all do as corporates, uh, it's really important to your employees and a number of stakeholders. Um, investors don't look at that in the context of investment decision making or analysis. Uh, there are other things we look at, you know, uh, you know, clinical trial safety, your approach to access to medicines supply chain integrity, um, mm -hmm. you know, FDA notices of violation, et cetera. There are other factors that, that we're gonna look at. Um, and so that's, I think, important to know. We also, at, at DSC Meridian, we look very deeply at what you guys say about yourselves, right? Not just your sustainability report, but we look at all of your SEC materials, your uh, investor presentations, any media articles, um, you know, we look at third party uh, regulatory and other kinds of sources of information to build a picture. And then, you know, then we'll approach your management team with specific questions and, and lines, of, you know, uh, to, to fill out the picture. We're always very collaborative. We're not interested in blowing you up. We're interested in your long term success. And for us, ESG is not a style of investing. It's a valuable part of our investment process. It's a tool. Uh, and it's a tool for us to understand how you are managing risks, how you are managing opportunities that are associated with sustainability. Uh, what are the value drivers here? What, what are the risk mitigators? Uh, and does your management team really focus on long-term uh, execution on strategy and value creation? That's what we're interested in. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah. Sort of, you know, given your in-depth approach, I think, to the decision-making and obviously a lot of the due diligence work that you do, I'm really curious, is the move toward mandatory reporting, providing investors with sort of a comparable transparent disclosure, is that helping you in the work that you're going to be doing in the future? I think it's better than what a lot of investors rely on, which is the third-party ESG scores. We don't use them um, because uh, they basically score your ability to uh, disclose and set targets that publicly as opposed to what you're actually doing operationally, but that's a separate topic. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, if it, when it goes into your 10K, it's probably being checked in a way that it isn't in the sustainability report, right? So I'm thinking about the climate data and the new SEC rule that is on pause right now, but I think will probably stand. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, my concern with, with all the reporting and, and in Europe, you know, the reporting is very onerous, as many of you know. It's a lot of data points, it's double materiality. 
Uh, I, I've talked to a number of companies that have to expand their staff, sadly, just for reporting. And for me, this is driving towards uh, a, a culture where we value reporting over operational excellence and where companies are sent the message that reporting is the out is the outcome desired here, not how you operate. And that that has me concerned. Right, right. Understandably so. Okay. And we're seeing it within our own company. So um, you know, I, I, I would rather see I'd rather see your team, Veronica, you know, working with you know, R and D working with supply chain, you know, on real operational issues, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to spending time answering surveys, um, you know, gathering data that really may not be important to your business, but some regulator has said you have to disclose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can fully appreciate that position. I feel um, your pain. Remember, I was one of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Well, so and tell me, okay, in your mind, and you know, how does more disclosure translate into greater value creation? I don't think it does. I mean, look, uh, disclosure is, it, transparency is always a good thing. Uh, comparable data is always very useful for us, uh, for anybody trying to make a decision, right? Um, but value creation is really understanding you got, you know, at the corporate level, at the, at the leadership level, all the way down to the shop floor, um, which sustainability issues, you know, drive value creation for your enterprise? What gives you a competitive advantage? And I can assure you, it's not 1,200 data points. It's probably a half a dozen things that drive value. And it's going to vary from industry to industry. What, you know, what works in biopharma uh, and what is important in biopharma is not the same, you know, sort of set of value drivers and risk uh, issues in oil and gas or industrials. And so, you know, really focusing in on what helps us manage our risks? Where can we create more opportunity? Um, and how does that affect our cost of capital and our security price over time? Any final thoughts that you think might be useful to this or you know, to the organizations and sort of the sectors on the call um, as we think about sort of ESG from an investor perspective? Yeah, I mean, obviously particular to PQMD, Access to medicines is, an, is a hugely material issue for pharmaceutical companies, and the NGOs on this call are critical to uh, to, to executing on that piece of corporate strategy. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, thinking about you know broad brush how you approach access, not just through donations, but you know licensing or partnerships. Um, you know, getting that, trying to figure out beyond you know, donations, which is important. How do we actually, uh, you know, expand access in a sustainable way and through various market-driven mechanisms is also an important thing. And, and the people on this call and their companies and, and organizations have a critical role. Um, for you have an interesting no. industry. I, I know that when I worked at Pfizer, every day when I woke up and went to work, and I can say this, I think for everyone at Pfizer, we all knew we were coming in and making a contribution to human health. Stakeholders have huge criticisms of the industry. There's no question, right? We've all heard them. I'm not gonna rehash them here, but at the end of the day, this is an industry that connects directly to human benefit. Uh, I don't know that I had that sentiment when I was at Hess. I don't know that you know when you work at a JP Morgan, you feel that same direct connection, but this is a really special you know, uh, or um, type of industry that creates value, it creates you know, social value, but it also creates economic value. And and I think, you know, really focusing on that unique uh, uh, Venn diagram that you have uh, is a huge advantage. Thank you, Paula. Brilliant. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought in the NGO perspective because I think that helps us sort of ground um, the conversation. So thank you. Okay. Sure. So invaluable perspective. I think we'll turn it over to DLA Piper. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, our first speaker is Nick. So thank you so much for being here and sort of helping us, you know, illuminate our understanding of the ESG reporting landscape, which we all know is coming. It's the tsunami ahead of us. Uh, and it is, um, I think, our opportunity uh, to really think long and hard about how we prepare. Uh, so, you know, we know a leading organization, you know, you're a leading organization sort of helping clients transition and thrive in a more sustainable future. I think as you work with your clients like Baxter, you know, who loves working with DLA, I might add, um, you know, how are you navigating and helping companies identify their purpose and sort of build their ES ESG transparency? Thanks, Veronica. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so 
I, I spend, I'm an environmental lawyer. I've been practicing environmental law in the EU and the UK for 30 years. Um, and I'll say, because you asked at the beginning about different people's perspectives, what does it mean for me? Uh, well, despite having been practicing environmental law for 30 years, there has never been a busier time to be in this space. Um, I'm not convinced there's any such thing as an ESG lawyer, by the way. I think anybody who says they are is probably uh, underestimating the scale of the task. Um, to me, ESG, whether we like the term or not, is as much a context for what we're all doing these days as, as, a, as a discipline. Although there are obviously individual subjects within that overall context. We are, as has been said, in a period of transition from voluntary to mandatory sustainability reporting. Sustainability reporting, of course, being just one of many, many aspects of ESG. And in some ways, we're in the worst possible stage at the moment because there's a, uh, a complete lack of harmonization of approach across the globe, particularly if you're a, a global company. Um, all of that said, I think, I think it's fair to say that the EU is leading the world on this topic right now. Mm -hmm. Might sound controversial, I say that as a citizen of a country that's chosen to leave the EU. So I'm saying that objectively. And I don't mean in terms of the quality or the efficacy of the EU's lawmaking. That's a subject for another day. And, you know, everyone's entitled to different opinions on that subject. But I mean in terms of um, EU laws on mandatory sustainability reporting being the most advanced in terms of timeline and rollout and most wide ranging in terms right. of their scope. And I think there are a few things um, that everybody needs on this call needs to know about the EU position. Um, first of all, key EU laws in this space are in force and they're not going away. They're not drafts, they're not proposals, they're not being debated. Um, I mean, they might go away in 10 years time, but for now they're here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and they're coming into force soon, I'll come on to that. We have laws across the EU and UK at member state level. We've got the German LKSG, for example, um, the French Devoir de Vigilance, the Norwegian Transparency Act. These are all mandatory sustainability and due diligence reporting laws. We also have EU-wide laws, and I'm thinking particularly of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, usually abbreviated to the CSRD, and the Taxonomy Regulation, which is very closely related to it and has the same thresholds, by the way. All of these laws, by and large, are sector agnostic. So they, the only trigger is whether you're a company that's large enough to be caught by them. They apply equally to the medical and healthcare sector as they do to the textile sector or the toys or electronics sector. They're mandatory. They require annual public reporting. They don't just get filed on a shelf somewhere. We expect them to be poured over. And in the EU, they extend to all aspects of ESG, certainly not just to climate change. So all of the aspects that you described at the outset, Veronica. Um, for that reason, they do require a substantial, holistic, whole company approach, a very systematic approach to preparing for compliance. Um, they also require companies to analyze their position and conduct diligence across their whole value chain not just their own position, but the position of their direct and indirect suppliers up and downstream, which is another reason why the EU is such a big nut to crack. Um, the CSRD and taxonomy, which I said go together, apply very soon. If you're not already caught by predecessor regimes, but you're in scope, and I'll say what that is in a second, the first data gathering compliance period is your first financial year commencing on or after the 1st of January, 2025. Mm -hmm. So if you have a calendar year, financial year, it's just eight months away. Mm -hmm. Now it's true that you would only be reporting in 2026, but any well-advised company is gonna be prepared ahead of the compliance period so that they can be gathering the right data and trying to make tweaks to produce the best report they can. The thresholds um, are very low actually. A company is in scope if it meets two of three thresholds, 250 employees, lots of companies won't necessarily have that, 25 million euros worth of assets, that's not very many, 
or a 50 million euros worth of turnover. And it's any two of those three. That captures a lot of companies, something like 15,000 different companies in the EU. And when you bear in mind that if you have an EU group with an EU intermediate parent, you aggregate all the numbers together to see if you meet those thresholds, that's not a high threshold. Mm -hmm. um, I'll finish by saying all of this, I know we've got probably a high preponderance of US-based folks on the call. Everything I've just said is highly relevant to US companies for several reasons. First of all, if you've got EU subsidiaries in scope that meet the thresholds I've just described, they'll be in force. They'll be um, in scope and required to report. Um, secondly, if they are reporting, you'll need to make sure that what they're saying about your business is consistent with what you're saying about your business under Californian rules or SEC rules or whatever, Australian rules, whatever they may be. Secondly, um, the EU key EU laws I've mentioned will apply to ultimate overseas holding companies in a few years' time from 2028. That's highly controversial, and we don't have time to get into that. But if you have a US headquartered Topco, you, pr you may well be caught by these rules from 2028. And thirdly, and finally, even if you don't have one or more subsidiaries in scope of these EU laws, it's very likely that you are part of someone else's value chain, someone else who is covered by these laws, who will be reaching out to you and making requests and asking to change contracts and asking for information and certifications because they're obliged by these laws. So that's why I've never been busier as an environmental or ESG lawyer working in the EU UK. Well, I think that value chain association is a really key point. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. So. As you're looking at, you know, when who are you typically engaging with in, within organizations on this type of regulatory report? Like, who's usually running things as you're sort of engaging with these companies? That's a great question, actually. It's a question we always get asked um, because everybody's trying to figure out the best way to do this um, and looking to benchmark themselves. I mean, of course, as lawyers, we commonly get contacted by in-house lawyers, but that's just the entry point. Um, for large companies, complex organizations with long value chains, multiple ge geographies, um, we, we quickly find that um, companies recognize that this, this cannot be simply the role, the responsibility of legal or sustainability. But actually, as, a, as we both said, I think it's a, it's a holistic uh, exercise and it requires the establishment of a committee of people, stakeholders within the company drawn from across different divisions. It certainly requires a lot of input from finance, um, compliance, regulatory affair. Or basically, it's, it's a whole of business approach. Um, and then the only thing that tends to constrain that is different companies are on different stages of their journey in relation to this mm -hmm. and their own ESG maturity. And that's perfectly, you know, it is what it is. So some companies are looking at this and saying, gosh, there's a lot to do here. For year one, let's just focus on fair compliance. And at the other end of the spectrum, those who are more, more mature in their development of ESG are perhaps looking at being trying to be best in class. I would say the majority at the moment are saying, we just we want to kind of do our best and sail under the radar. We want to be middle of the pack. And all of those factors will influence the amount of resource that uh, companies throw at this. But the, most commonly, we're seeing an internal committee plus external bench, typically comprised of external lawyers and external consultants. I mean, you know, I think one of the key takeaways I'm hearing is that it, it, focusing on the EU CSRD is one of the first regulations. And if the first reporting year is 2025, you know, how should how soon should in scope companies you know start their preparation i mean i think what i heard is yesterday um is there anything that you would want to underscore there or say more about i mean it, it's easy for me to say yesterday um that's the slightly flippant answer but in this occasion it's true um the, the clock really is ticking i mean you you can you could prepare to be ready for csrd in eight months but you would need to start tomorrow and really, really crack on with it. There's a lot to do. Yeah. Um, and of course, the project gets halted 
when you get to the point where you need some data, it's not available. People have to go out to the business and ask for it, and then that stops your progress. Um, the good news is it can be done in that time. We, um, we've developed a, a, a clear process for doing it, which means I'm confident that it could be done in that time. Um, and the other bit of good news is I said that CSRD and taxonomy are two separate laws with separate reporting requirements that apply from the same date um, to the same scope of companies. Good news is taxonomy is quite a bit easier to comply with. So you could probably start next week on taxonomy. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe if you're okay, Nick, I'm going to move over to Christy um, to ask some questions there. Um, I know you have a flight to catch, so uh, if we don't see you for a minute, we'll know that you're you're in route. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your perspective. So my pleasure, Christy. Um, over to you. I'm wondering um, if our first reporting year um, in 2024 for can you know for California with so the for further deadlines for California. There's the SEC. There's the you know federal contract uh, work. You know how should sort of in scope entities start? their preparation? Like what is, you know, what about the SEC lawsuits and what about other states like California? And there are others that look like might be following. So if you could just sort of illuminate for us sort of how we should be thinking about it, what we should be thinking about and sort of uh, some best practices that you might have encountered as you've been doing this work. No, thank you, Veronica. And thank you so much for having me here. And it's a pleasure to speak about this. Nick and I work really closely, Nick and his team being London EU side. I sit in the Washington DC office. So while we've been hearing about the EU and all of that they're moving forward on on this, the US is an important piece as companies think of that whole company approach that Nick mentioned. And so as you mentioned, um, there's a um, different approach that the US is taking on it because as you heard from Nick, the EU is going forward. It's mainly through starting point, as you mentioned, the EU taxonomy and the EU corporate social, um, sustainability reporting directive is CSRD. And those are both whole sustainability topics, Veronica, all the topics that you mentioned at the top of this session from the environmental side to social and governance, the EU is looking to report on all of those topics. It's quite broad. In the US, we're taking a different approach and the key areas that we're looking at right now, at least on the federal level, as you mentioned, the Securities and Exchange Commission, so public companies, um, or if you're a foreign private issuer that fall under the SEC rules, many of you may have um, heard that um, about two years ago, there was a proposed rule for climate-related risk disclosure. And um, it was quite a new type of rule and there were about 16,000 comments that came into the SEC that had a lot of different opinions and different approaches and concerns, and um, but also encouragement too. So really across different types of comments that um, the SEC received. And after two years, just issued um, in March, there was a vote that approved the SEC climate-related um, risk disclosure rule. And so that um, was quite a significant change for the US. And um, as you then may have heard, and as you alluded to, literally the day that the SEC rule was approved, that started a string of lawsuits that have been filed um, in various courts. So there was about nine lawsuits um, that immediately um, went forward. And now that is in a stage that is a consolidation stage. So instead of having nine different suits, there's one consolidated lawsuit. And in addition to that, the SEC has also voluntarily, uh, they issued an order staying the rule. So it's on hold while the lawsuits go forward. So that's an important dynamic because as Nick mentioned, those of you who may then be thinking, oh, so what is happening in the US side with the SEC? As Nick mentioned, the EU though is going forward and that's something we need to really keep in mind um, as the US navigates what may be happening with this litigation. And so there's a challenge of the SEC's authority on this, um, but at the same time, we're recommending that clients, companies, entities that fall under the SEC and beyond still 
understand what the rule, what this final rule says, even though it stayed, so that there's an understanding of um, differences that companies may have to navigate in comparison to the EU. And to also think about um, if the, for any reason, SEC rule, if it does, doesn't does um, succeed in the, in the litigation, and again, it's uncertain, we don't know what will happen, but at the end of the day, companies still have a materiality requirement with SEC, regardless as that is now, and it may be the SEC takes a you know, harder approach to that going forward. So we just have to monitor that and see, but it's still important to understand what um, the requirements are. And most importantly, as you may have known in the um, proposed rule, there's um, a lot of controversy about scope. So scope, what's called scope one, two, and three. And so on your greenhouse gas emissions. And um, that has really been a controversial piece because scope one being your own emissions, your what you your, your, you yourself have. Scope two is sort of what you would be um, purchasing like electricity and scope three is your entire value chain. And so the original proposal did have scope one, two, and three, but on scope three, that has been removed from the final rule. And um, that is something that was a, a very large controversy. However, as Nick mentioned, again, the comparative piece with what the EU is requiring is across scope one, two, and three. And then in addition for the SEC, there's also thinking about um, whether that scope one and two is material or not. So there's still a materiality assessment that has to be done. And then there's a broader context of governance, how risk um, and climate is managed and the strategy and the goals and targets. So it's quite broad and you know we encourage to make sure companies understand where that sits and how that fits with the EU. And then as you noted, then we have the states and what the states are doing in the US and California, um, which shouldn't be a surprise, is leading that here in the US. And in October, there were three bills that were passed related to greenhouse gas emissions disclosures as well as um, climate related risk, as well as carbon offsets and marketing claims. So it's a pretty broad package. And as you noted, the first of those bills went into effect Jan 1 of this year. And that's related to if you're using purchasing, selling carbon offsets, or if you're making net zero marketing claims. And um, this is something that you're now expected to report on by California. So there's a concern about what um, California consumers so that they have transparent information about that. So that's in effect now. And then the greenhouse gas emissions and the climate related risk that is coming into effect in the next couple of years. And so companies, as Nick said, starting to think about what data they have, what they don't have. And what's really important is California applies to both public and private companies as well. And of course, there is a threshold of revenue. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions is at a $1 billion revenue. And then there's also, uh, for green, the climate related risk is at $500 million revenue and operating in California. So there is some thresholds. It's important to understand if you're in scope or not, but that's um, a big game changer. And other states such as Washington state, Illinois, New York are looking at pro potential proposals in that space as well. And then I'll flag, as um, you mentioned, the federal contractor. So anyone who is a federal contractor in the US, there's also a proposed rule for federal contractors that have certain contract obligations. And there's thresholds there where if um, you fall into those, you may have to consider additional reporting too. So that whole patchwork, you asked about that practical approach, is really what, what we're working on with Nick's team is to think about what's required in all of these different jurisdictions and what's a consolidated basis, what's an overlap, what can be leveraged and thinking about practically, as Nick mentioned with that, if you have an internal committee or task force to really think about how to proceed in a way that's actually manageable given all these varying requirements. Right. Thank you. Thank you. How, how should we think about like TCFD and SASB and all the things that most companies are already doing? Like what are the implications of the work that we're doing there? And how do you imagine sort of the consolidation of this? It, do you imagine it as a framework? Do you imagine it as, as a, uh, you know, a new corporate responsibility report? You know, how, how are you seeing this or what, what it, or what's your current thinking? I know this is evolving in a dynamic landscape. 
No, it's an excellent question. And we, what we talked about is that leveraging. So on the one hand, mapping out all the legal requirements for these very rules and directives, but then leveraging what you may already be doing for SASB or TCFD, the greenhouse gas protocol, because at least in the US, the SEC is built off of the TCFD. Similarly, in California, the climate related risk rule, the SB 261 is also built off of TCFD. The greenhouse gas um, emissions for the California rule, also for the um, GHG, it's the GHG protocol. So those are examples where if you're already disclosing under those to think about what you're already pulling together and does that meet these new rules. The rules oftentimes will ask for a little bit more th than those because they're built off the frameworks, but there is some more legal requirement but there's certainly ones that should be leveraged to see what you're already doing and to see how best to approach it again in a more practical way, given the varying degrees of requirements. As you look at sort of EU and US, so if you're looking at sort of the differences in approach, um, how should companies like multinational companies in particular, how should they navigate? Is it, we default to EU? Do we sort of have to do both? Like, how are you seeing that? And just briefly give us a sense there before we move on. Yeah, I think the key thing is, again, Matt, to, to define what those legal requirements are, really know that deadlines are really key because there are phase-in, as Nick said, for the EU. Um, and then in the US, this, these phase-in approaches, um, depending on sort of where you sit. And really mapping that out on the front end is really the first step is that scope applicability deadlines. And then from there to be able to devise a strategy in conjunction with the company priorities and goals on this overall, because it is a whole company, mandatory reporting is one aspect of it, but where does that fit in to an overall approach is really key. Thank you. This is illuminating. I think, you know, for those of us that are companies that are trying to navigate this landscape, um, I think expert advice is always helpful in terms of how we tackle and how we think about, you know, building a practical approach. So thank you. Um, um, looking forward to some of the questions that might be coming in sort of relative to what you've shared. So with this, I will move over to Erica Tavares. I think a highly important perspective as we think about um, where we want to go today. I mean, from a leading NGO perspective, whose organization day in and day out is sort of responding to catastrophic, the catastrophic natural disasters, global pandemics, deadly, you know, regional conflict and humanitarian crisis. Like how how is your organization really tackling sort of climate change, right? Um, in the in a, maybe in a different and and or in a very similar way that we might be as as corporations, sort of, and the broader ESG implications. You know, as you work with corporate partners, as you think about your institution on the front lines, how are you thinking about this? And you know, it it, it feels as there are some ways on the periphery of the ESG conversation, but it's incredibly important work um, that we do. So I, I'd love to hear from your perspective um, what you what, what what your thoughts are. Right. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for having me. And it's um, been just a really great conversation to to, to listen and, and to learn more, which I think you're right, Veronica. I mean, it, it can feel as a nonprofit organization that we are on the periphery of this conversation. But I think um, it's, it is incredibly important. And I think, you know, um, as you've said, the tenants of ESG, separate from the reporting, the tenants of ESG are, are here to stay. Um, and as Paula alluded to, you know, I think Nonprofit organizations are going to be incredibly important partners in helping our, our in helping private sector companies um, achieve their ESG goals. And so, um, when we're thinking about it from a nonprofit perspective, I think it really reiterates for us the importance of having the kind of really um, transparent, um, well-developed partnerships that we talk about a lot here at PQMD because um, there's a number of ways that this that this can impact us. I mean. It, it, it can um, very likely have a very positive impact on the work that we do, right? Um, integrating these values across the business is going potentially to mean there's additional resources for some of the giving programs, whether that's cash or, or donations of medicines for access to medication programs. Um, we've seen, you know, an increase in employee engagement programs, uh, corporate volunteerism, employee giving programs, and all of these things um, have led to changes in how we potentially work with our, our corporate partners. Um, and we've really worked together to try and, and create new opportunities and new ways for us to support each other. And so it can have a, a you know, sort of a net positive effect um, because um, there's so much cross-cutting between 
the values of the, uh, that are espoused in ESG, the values of the organization, the values of the company, is that we can be really strong partners um, in, in doing that implementation. Um, I think, uh, you know, understanding some of the challenges is also really helpful to us that corporations may face. Um, and understanding what may be coming down the road for us as a nonprofit partner who might be implementing some of these ESG programs. Um, so does that mean there's going to be new data requirements? Are there going to be changes to the way that proposals are, are crafted or the, the criteria that you're looking at? Um, you know, what are our partners evolving ESG priorities? So again, we can continue to really work together and have those conversations so we can continue to do the good work that we're doing um, in partnership with you and we can help our, our corporate partners achieve their goals. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that is increasingly clear to us on the nonprofit side is that, you know, all today's conversation is, is, is more focused on sort of the impact of ESG on reporting and some of the reporting requirements, this conversation has really started to, in the last several years, go beyond um, sort of the private sector or private sector and NGO partnerships. We're seeing this across the sector uh, for humanitarian and health. This language of ESG, these um, sort of tenets of, of the work that we do, um, you know, the need to continue to innovate and adapt is coming through um, from other donors and partners as well. So we're seeing it from governments, we're seeing it from foundations who are starting to ask us questions like, um, you know, what is your environmental sustainability plan? How are you thinking about climate change? What is your commitment to diversity? And so the fact that the language and the values are starting to transcend across the sector is also where it starts to impact nonprofits. So again, being part of this conversation, really understanding where it's going, it's incredibly important for us to continue to be able to do the work that we do. Um, you know, as a nonprofit, I think, you know, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear, um, you know, as we start to move into a, um, the, the Q and A period of, of, of this webinar, um, you know, how are our private sector partners or, or how does this panel see potential changes, uh, coming for nonprofits? Will there be changes in reporting that we can, you know, that we can start to prepare for? Um, mm -hmm. Are there going to be greater needs to understand our supply chain, how we deliver goods and services? You know, what are the things we can start thinking about because they're going to be, it's going to be helpful information for you um, as this sort of evolves and, and moves forward. So I think that's something that I continue to be really interested to hear about and we sort of put that out there, um, you know, as we start to move into the, to the Q&A portion. Yeah, that's an interesting, um, it's interesting what you've mentioned about sort of the donor requirements and sort of mm -hmm. how we're thinking about it, but can you maybe... Um, tell me a little bit more how ESG may be affecting your own policies. Can maybe give us an example. Of what how is the IMC thinking about this, even sure. sort of internally as an organization? Sure, I think um, probably one of the the sort of clearest examples um, is um, really related to our 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 climate and sustainability uh, policies, which we've really taken a look at um, across the organization and from a variety of different lenses. We're looking at it in our own programming and how do we support programs that. Um, help communities adapt to climate change. But, um, you know, we're also seeing it, um, you know, one, because it is the right thing to do. And we are part of this conversation, we have to look at our own carbon footprint, but very specifically, um, ECHO funding requires a sustainability plan. And so we have to have a plan in place um, that we can share as part of any kind of proposal or reporting that we're giving to um, to echo to say, here's our sustainability plan and here's how we are moving forward on, on achieving the goals that we're laying out. And so I think it's a really good and tangible um, example of how this conversation starts to move throughout the entire sector and whether or not a nonprofit is, is specifically responsible for um, the kinds of ESG reporting that I know a lot of our private sector partners are looking at the um the values around that start to 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 come through the entire sector as well and so you know we start to see this appear in other ways and i think that's a, a really tangible way so we are measuring our carbon footprint um we do look at that annually it helps to drive some day-to-day -day operational decisions um you know part of our sustainability planning is also looking at how we pre-position supplies um, how we increase efficiencies, how we leverage solar energy as well. So um, those are just some of the sort of more hands-on ways that we're taking a look at that. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. It's really sort of great to hear how, from an NGO perspective, you might be really looking at your procurement logistics, you know, supply chain, carbon footprint, 
um, and, and leveraging obviously the opportunities for you know solar energy and you know increased efficiencies in sort of the fleets and the work that you do. So um, I think the NGO perspective is really important to understanding sort of this complex ESG landscape um, because it's it's it, it applies to all of us. So. So I think we're opening up for Q&A and I just, you know, a big round of applause and thank you um, to our speakers. We're really so grateful um, for your perspectives and the insights that you've shared. So Victoria, is there anything in our in the chat our speakers should address or what questions do we have? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll start with the last question that I saw. Would, uh, would love to hear from those companies that must report on CSRD, um, CEC, et cetera. Where does sustainability reporting in your company sit? Finance, CSR, or legal? So I'm happy to jump in as, as a company um, and to say all of the above. So I think part of what we're learning with the DLA, um, they've done a gap analysis for us to sort of help us determine um, how best we need to reorg. I mean, I would say historically, we have fallen under corporate responsibility, which would be under me, my remit, uh, under global communications, because it really was more of a communications of how we were progressing against um, our you know, sort of established goals. Uh, but I think as we're looking at the EU CSRD landscape, the taxonomy, you know, SEC, et cetera, what we're finding is, and what we've learned with our DLA landscape, um, sort of as, as we've gone through some of our phases, is that we really need to think about the organizational structure differently because now there's more information that's needed from different functions within our company. It's legal, it's finance, you know, it's our enterprise risk management group, it's, um, you know, it's corporate responsibility and reporting and then disclosure. So, you know, we're looking at this and saying that, and, and I, I don't want to leave out uh, environmental health, safety and sustainability group, right? Like we're looking at this and saying we need a, we need a different gang um, to come together to sort of pull off the reporting required. And we need to be very lock and step with our European group uh, and groups that might need to report. So, you know, we're sort of all looking at how this landscape is helping us evolve an operational structure that'll help us address and report. So I will speak for me. I don't know if there's another company that wants to respond as well. Just from the investor perspective, um, you know, these CSRD and the SEC, when it does come into force, requires assurance, right? And so, you know, again, as, as Veronica said, this is no longer a public affairs uh, issue only. Uh, this is tantamount to Sarbanes-Oxley. This is something your CFO is going to have to sign off. And so that's a blessing and a curse. And the blessing I think is that um, sustainability teams will be much more integrated into strategy and operations than they were before. Um, and really um, kind of seen as central, not just, just to compliance, but to maybe executing on part of the strategy that makes the company more resilient over time. Where as before it was perhaps communications function more than not. Great point. Great. Uh, Heather Watts from HPIC has raised her hand. So Heather, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for a really um, comprehensive and informative presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a question. It kind of uh, came up a couple of times with alternate um, frameworks for measuring, I guess, um, SASB being the main, main one to focus on. But some of the other ones um, that I've heard of that people are using and what advice you would give to companies that are using another framework such as the TCFD or uh, the GRI, um, what should be their approach to, should they just you know, get rid of those and go right to SASB? Or another one that I wanted to add, this is like sort of a second part of the question because there are a lot of NGOs on this call and it's a sort of NGO pharma connection would be the, um, United Nations Global Compact to measure, measure uh, SDG performance. I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit about alternative frameworks and what should be the path ahead for combining them or scrapping all of them in favor of uh, one particular framework. Yeah, I'm happy to kick us off in terms of what we do at Baxter and just to say, you know, we do SASB, we do TCFD, uh, we have, you know, we um, align with uh, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, um, and we're looking now, obviously, at EU CSRD and the taxonomy. So I think part of what's happening, at least for us as a company, is evaluating all these frameworks and saying, you know, how do we best pivot uh, to be able to report um, consistently, uh, globally, 
I, and so we're under evaluation, I would say. I mean, I think, you know, that's what we've been doing. And that's historically where, you know, or at least the reporting that we've done. And we have an annual corporate responsibility report that we've done. And, you know, we share um, a, a pretty, you know, pretty robust uh, data set on a lot of our work. So I think this is the inflection point. I think this is the question. I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head, which is we're all trying to figure out based on what we're already doing or have been doing, um, how do we how do we um, prepare for additional reporting requirements? And then honestly do the mapping against what we're already reporting. So I don't have enough information to say which one goes, which one stays. I think um, that's part of the work that we're doing. Maybe DLA Piper has some recommendations in terms of how they might be advising companies um, and or Paula and others might want to weigh in. No, I think that's right. I can take it from the U.S. side. That's exactly what we're seeing. Um, it's not just suddenly no one's reporting under those frameworks. I think you're right that we have to see how this will evolve as the mandatory piece comes in with those voluntary pieces. And as we mentioned, some of these rules also are built off of those, those frameworks, but they're not exact either. So, you know, that's why it's really important what you mentioned about the gap analysis, the sort of comprehensive, you know, the requirements across the board to see where you fit and really creating a strategy. And I know we've been focused on the US and the EU today, but also other countries are actually looking towards the ISSB, the SASB, you know, other countries may also require some different approaches that are voluntary now, but then may make them mandatory. So depending where your global footprint sits, it's important to also see what's happening because we didn't have enough time to go through the global piece, but there are other countries that are moving towards this and that's just an important element of this. But Annie, I know from the, the EU side, if you want to add in on that, because that's an important piece as well. No, I think I agree with um, with all of that, both from Veronica and Christy. Um, as you say, Christy, you know, there are a number of of other frameworks being developed around the EU in particular, we're seeing, you know, um, country specific frameworks being developed. And so that's another sort of factor to consider where those are mandatory, you know, how those fit alongside um, the, these uh, re reporting requirements that we've discussed today. But in terms of the voluntary stuff, I think it very much does depend on the company um, and it depends on the goals of the company and, um, you know, how, how, it most makes sense for them to move forward in terms of their sustainability story and what they're trying to achieve. So sorry, that's not a particularly um, clear answer, but it is, uh, unfortunately, the answer is I think it, it will depend. Um, but certainly some people are continuing to report under voluntary frameworks as well as mandatory. It's, it doesn't have to be one or the other in the EU either. I mean, I think, you know, to me, the, the short answer is I think it requires a lot of mapping for any company to understand what makes sense um, and how to best sort of look at the current landscape, which is, you know, sort of optional and uh, to, to where we're going, which is in some of the mandatory and how best to adjust and map um, all of the different frameworks and what information might overlap, and, you know, ideally not duplicate. Yeah. Here's a, another question for our legal perspectives. Uh, what are the consequences if you don't comply in year one to the new CSR directive in the EU? Sure. Yeah. Can answer that one. Um, <laughs> So the formal consequences in terms of, you know, enforcement and penalties is yet to be determined um, because we're still in the process of seeing member states implement this law into their own local legislation and, and um, penalties are left to member states to establish, you know, based on their own uh, method for doing so. So on that level, you know, they're, they're if, you, if you're in breach, there may be some level of enforcement, there likely would be some level of enforcement that may look like a fine. Um, but probably the key consequence that's more important for a lot of our clients, and I'm sure for, for most companies really, is the reputational consequences related to um, mm -hmm. not reporting on this stuff when, you were, when you're required to. Um, so, you know, that not reporting, as I said, obviously that puts you in breach and that's something that's likely to be noticed and flagged um, by those with an interest in, you know, ensuring that large companies are meeting their obligations. So that's 
possibly going to be um, the, the more sort of significant consequence that a lot of our clients will be thinking about. How does it look if we simply ignore our requirements? So with that, um, I am going to close this out. Thank you all for joining. Please join me in thanking our speakers for their time, keys, insights, and just for joining us today to just share um, so much information with us. I want to take an opportunity to highlight, um, you know, the, and plug you know, for the corporate sector folks on the call, um, the DLA Piper workshop that will be conducting an incredible uh, workshop in New York City at Pfizer's headquarters on the 30th. Um, April for our regulatory reporting landscape. And as one of their clients, again, I can speak enthusiastically about their support. So please do, if you haven't registered, uh, you know, get your seat at the table for the workshop. And again, thank you uh, to our uh, distinguished uh, panel speakers and thank you all for your time today. Thank you for having us. And thanks. many thanks to PQMD and Veronica for uh, organizing the session. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, all.